Hello and a warm welcome. I am Armin Trost, Professor for Organizational Behavior at the Furtwangen University in Germany and this is my course on Social Research Methods. Hello everybody. Today we talk about testing. Testing. For those who deal with psychology, this is an absolutely essential topic because in psychology we test a lot. Uh, that, that is a domain of what we name the differential psychology. In differential psychology we assume that people differ and they differ in different terms. They differ, for instance, with regards to their intelligence. They differ with regards to their psychology, to name the most important uh, dimensions here. And when, whenever we assume that people differ in something, then we also want to measure it, right? But also when we look at other things like, like I mean, look at a regular exam in any university, we test, right? We, we use a, a variety of different uh, smaller exercises and the sum of these different exercises, they help us to get an overall score, which we name then the grade. Mm -hmm. So, Testing is essential. Also, when we, when we measure customer satisfaction, maybe, or employee satisfaction, or motivation, or, or whatever. I mean, all these theoretical concepts, we, we have some procedures, and in the end, we want to have a score, right? a number that tells, okay, this person is um, so motivated, <laughs> and that person is so intelligent, and this person has this personality. So, and we always want to have figures. This is the idea. And um, I would like to introduce you a little bit into this world of testing. And when we do so, we always have to think about the so-called classical test theory. Okay, here is a fundamental idea. And it's simple, but, and it's brilliant, <laughs> genius. And it's the, it's the ground assumption for almost every testing. Um, when we test, or when we, whenever we measure something, we get a value, okay? A measured value. This is, this is not a surprise to you. It's also when you, when you measure the weight of, of yourself, you get a value. When you measure the length of a table, you get a value. Right? If you measure the, the speed of your car in a given moment, you get a value. That's the measured value. That's the value that represents something, or is at least supposed to, to represent something. Okay? And um, let's, let's say the measured value is x. X. Okay, that's the measured value. Now, there is this idea, then whenever you measure something, whatever it is, there is always a truth in it and it's always an error in it. Both things. And the measured value is nothing else than the true value, which you don't know, I mean, otherwise you would not measure, plus the error. Okay? In other words, in every measurement, in every single measurement, there is a little bit an error. Okay? So, um, a very nice story from history uh, uh, gives you a little bit uh, first step into this uh, fundamental idea here. We talk about Francis Galton. Francis Galton was a mathematician in the 19th century. Francis Galton, I mean, he's, I, I suppose he was the, the inventor of the bell curve, the normal curve that you've, we're going to talk about this as well. And I mean, this was a very curious man, um, a, a true scientist, I would say, and a brilliant mathem mathematician. And, and at that time, there was a nice game that you could find on, uh, on fairs. So when you went to the fair on a, on a, in, the, in the city, yeah, um, there, 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 it could happen that there is a game where somebody 
says, okay, look, here is an ox, <laughs> an ox, a cow, an animal, a horse, yeah, let's say an ox. Yeah. And the game goes like this. You pay an amount of money and then you can estimate the weight of the ox. So you say, okay, today you would say, okay, here are 10 euro or 10 dollar or whatever, and now I can estimate uh, the weight of this ox. And when at the end of the day I'm the one who is the closest to the real value of the ox, then I win what? <laughs> can get the ox. So I can take the ox home. And at that time it was, it was nice. So it could happen that um, you go to a fair and then you come home with an ox and you tell your wife, maybe your husband, look, I have won a wonderful prize, an ox. How great is that? <laughs> um, okay, Francis Galton, he visited that fair and he, at the end he asked the one who conducted that game to give him all the estimates. And he also asked the farmer, what is, can you tell me the real weight of the ox? And so he took all these estimates and it, he calculated an average, you know, so maybe there were a couple of hundreds estimates. So he took all these hundred estimates, calculated an average, and now it comes. The average estimate of all these hundreds of people were nearly exact the true value, the true weight of the ox. You see? Fantastic. How could that be? It's wonderful. Right? Why, is, why is that so cool? It's cool because that, that tells us that in every measurement, in every estimate, I mean, an estimate is a kind of a measurement, uh, even though it's a, maybe a rough one, yeah? there's always a truth in it and there is an error in it. So sometimes, let's say you have a true value which is 80, okay? Whatever that is, 80. And now somebody is guessing 110. Okay, the 110 is nothing else than the true value plus the error. The error, the true value is 80. Plus, plus 30, it's the error, is 110. Somebody underestimates uh, uh, the true value and estimates 70. Again, this is the true value plus the error, and the error in that case is a, is a negative value uh, of, of minus 10. Uh, 80 plus minus 10 is 70. So there is always, we can always say, any measure you do consists of a true value plus an error value. Okay? Got it? I mean, that's easy. It's easy. So, what the story of Francis Galton tells us now, and that's the fundamental idea behind the classical test theory, is that the error is random. What does that mean? In the case of the ox, Sometimes people overestimate, meaning a positive error, and some people underestimate, a negative error. And this error is random, right? It's, it's random. So, some overestimate, some underestimate, some really overestimate, some really underestimate. Oh, and if this is all random, things zero out. So the, the average, the average error is what? Zero. Zero. You see? The average value of error is zero. Right? Interesting, huh? So you can say if you measure many times, not only once, many times, you, in, in every single measure you have an error, but when you measure many times, you have multiple indicators, then the error will be zeroed out. And then that means the actual measurement that you have in the end is the true value. You got it? That's the idea. And, and that's exactly what we do in, uh, in every psychological test. You would never ever, you would never ever really uh, just uh, measure the intelligence of a person just based on one single exercise or one single uh, task. Never. You have multiple tasks. 
and, and you would never also also in an exam in a written exam as a, as a professor I mean yeah, that would be a mistake if you would rely just on one single exercise on one single question no you have multiple questions and sometimes a student does better, better than he deserves in, in, an, in an exercise and in the other exercise he, is, he does less than he would be if he should deserve based on his or her knowledge so but that that error that zeroes out yeah and when you have multiple exercises in total things be fine or look at the personality tests in a personality test uh, typically in a personality test you ask a lot of questions about what you prefer or how you tend to behave in different situations. This is what you do in personality tests. Do you like fantasy movies? Do you enjoy meeting other people? <laughs> do you like to have a plan? <laughs> and so things, things. And, and, and you know when you, when, you, when you respond to a personality question you always think okay hmm what should I say? And there's always this noise, you know. And, and with every single question, there's always an error in it. You should, you should take this box, but you don't. You do take this box, but you should have better take this box. And, and you know, this, in every response you give, there is a little bit an error. And once you assume this error is 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 random, then just ask multiple times. Ask multiple times. Measure not only once, measure many, many times, and then calculate an average, and then the error is zero, and what you get is the true value. That's test theory. That's it. Okay. So, what we do when creating a test. Now let me, let me move a little bit further further and that's something that is really relevant also for your for your practice I mean when you when you measure something when you test something as part of your research whatever it is when you measure customer satisfaction job satisfaction motivation or, or whatever uh, career ambition or certain preferences or or expectations uh, whatever it is um, you, you, you better ask multiple questions, right, around the same thing. We also will come to this point when we're going to talk about um, uh, surveys asking questions um, using questionnaires. You, you will ask multiple questions, not only one, right? If you, if you want to know uh, how religious somebody is, you would not just ask, do you believe in God? No, you would ask multiple things. You would ask, do you believe in God? Do you regularly pray or something like this? Do you visit uh, some ceremonies which are kind of spiritual? Uh, do you read things which are close to this religious belief? So you ask a couple of questions and then you have all these questions and when somebody, somebody says, yes, 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 you say, okay, very religious, <laughs> okay? So you will always use multiple questions. That's what you do. And when you do so, and, and let's assume you, you now test a lot of people. And this is what you do when you create a test. You create the test, you have the different items. That's also a, a, a term that we use, different items. In that case, we mean uh, questions. Could, but, uh, items could also be exercises, like in an in a intelligence test. You have different items, right? Let's say you have four items. Right? Let's put it simply. Yeah, four items. And you apply these four items for multiple people. Yeah? Let's say uh, 14 people. Okay? The, the result of that is that you have a raw data matrix, a classic raw data matrix where you have in the columns the different items and in the lines you have the different subjects. Right? And there's always, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> there's always a value in it. In every cell there's a value. Yeah? And this value might reflect something from strongly agree to strongly disagree or very satisfied to totally unsatisfied or from yes to no or, whatever, or correct, not correct, whatever it is. So. And what we do then in testing is we, and I indicated that already multiple times, is you, you, you calculate an overall score the so-called test score. That's an important term, yeah? test score. This is how we name it. And the test score very often is the sum of the, of the responses to the individual items. Okay? 
That's the test score. Now what you want to do in practice, and that's very practical really, is you want to know uh, do these items, are these items really cool? <laughs> do these items really fit into what I do? do it, that, does it make sense to ask these different items? Do these different items really all measure more or less the same? Do these items all revolve around the same theoretical concept? Okay, this is what you want. So, and for this, you calculate an item total correlation. Now, we will talk about correlation a little bit more, but but it's very, very essential that you understand what a correlation is, really. And this is the latest moment <laughs> where I really have to explain what that is if, if you don't know what a correlation is. Correlation is an is a absolutely essential statistical concept. We still do not talk about statistics, that comes later, but we, we now have to consider this now and you should have at least a little bit of understanding about correlation. You know, and it's, a, it's very simple. I mean, it's very simple. You always have, let's say, two variables, okay? And, and let's have a very simple uh, study. Uh, my question is, is there a relationship between um, wealth and happiness? Hmm? Can you imagine this? I say, is it really true that those who have much, much money or who are wealthy, that they are really happier? So, so I can do this study. I sometimes do it in the classroom. I, I ask all the students, here is a, take a piece of paper, please. Yeah? Uh, I do it online. <laughs> Just ask two questions. How many money do you have in your pocket on a monthly basis? Question number one, this is wealth, right? And the other question is, how happy are you on a scale from zero, totally depressed, to 10, extremely happy, okay? How much money do you have? How happy are you? And now I want to see, is there a relationship? So for every student in that case, I get two values, right? I get a wealth value, the money, and I get a happiness value. And, I, and for all the 100 students, let's say, yeah, I get these two values, pop, 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 pop. okay? So what I can now do is, I can make a, a very simple analysis, a correlation analysis that tell me, is there a linkage? And now the correlation can rank between minus one and plus one. What would it mean if it's plus one, which never happens in reality, but, but if it would be one, that would mean perfect, perfect relationship. The more money you have, the happier you are. That's it. If that's the outcome, point zero, that's the best possible correlation you could get. One. It could also be minus one. <laughs> that would mean the more money you have, the unhappier are you. If it would be zero, the correlation would mean there is no relationship at all. Whether you have much money, less money, wealthy and poor, that does not relate to happiness at all. Nothing, zero, completely independent. So that's correlation. Okay, it's an it's important term, important concept. We're going to have another chance to look at this. So it's important, yeah. correlation. The linear relationship between two variables. Hope you got it. I don't want to spend too much time on this now. So it's, it's important that you understood this topic because we need it now for testing. So what we do is we calculate an item total correlation. That's an important concept in testing, item total correlation. So I have an example here uh, and I have a couple of items here. Um, they go like this. Yeah? Do you love to dance? Are you at almost every party in town? Do you enjoy meeting new people? Do you make new friends easily? Do you like pizza? Do you like small talk? Do you think others like you? Yeah, you can guess what this uh, test is all about. This is a kind of, let's say, a kind of personality test that measures something that relates to extraversion, right? In person, in person, in personal, uh, in, in differential psychology, we would, we would name it that way probably. It's the tendency to go out, meet people, have party and so on, you know. 
and let we assume there is this uh, overall trait uh, that people are either more extroverted or less extroverted so and, and we measure it with these different items okay so in this case we did it yeah we asked all this item we, we asked many people to respond to all these items let's say 100 people and then we calculate a item total correlation okay so you know what the item total correlation is we correlate the single item with the total score. You know what the total score is? That's the sum of all items. And now we correlate the one single item with the total score. And now when you look at this result here, what do you see? It's with do you love to dance, 0.68. The highest is 0.86 with do you like to small talk, right? But there is one outlier, you see it? It's the question, do you like pizza? It's just point, point 0.18. Item total correlation with this item is 1.8. What does it tell us? What, what does this tell us? And if you have understood correlation, if you also have understood item total correlation, if not, just make a break and think about it again. Yeah? Uh, but if you have understood what that means, that you that, that, that this result will jump into your face and it will tell you, okay, hmm, this item, do you like pizza, does not relate to all the rest, does not relate to, the, to what this survey, or this test is all about in total. And that does not surprise. I mean, that, 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 that test, when you look at this item, this is about party, that's about extraversion. That's about meeting other people. And this question, do you like pizza? I mean, sorry, that's a, it, it does not fit into the rest. And this is, in, I mean, you, you also can already can tell it based on the wording and the semantic meaning of, of this item. But, but the numbers now tell you that this item does not belong to this set. And, and, and as a practical consequence, you would take out this number. Uh, you would take out this item. You would take this out because say well, it's a, that does not belong here. Take it out. So this is an analysis you always do when you create a test or when you when you create uh, something where you measure something based on multiple items. Okay, that's really important. You ha have to do it. Mm -hmm. So also, uh, for instance, you want to measure something like yeah. Sorry when I bring in many examples out of organizational uh, behavior, but uh, that's my field. <laughs> and maybe for some of you it's not too far away. Mm, you want to measure leadership quality, okay? You want to measure leadership quality and you assume that for, for different managers there is one, one overall score, right? And, and this overall score is measured based on multiple items. When you create something like this, a tool to measure leadership quality for whatever purpose, you have to do an, an analysis like this, really, you have to analyze the, 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 the item total correlation to find out in a first step which items belong in this total set of items and which not. It's really, it's really important. And then there is this other um, coefficient an indicator which is essential and heavily used in practice, it's the Kronbass Alpha. Kronbass Alpha is a concept that tells you how consistent a, a test is. So if you have a test where the items do not really intercorrelate, when every, every item measures something different than all the others, you know, then it's a, then it's a uh, it's a, it's a noisy, noisy, fuzzy thing with items measuring totally different things. Uh, then Kronbach's alpha is very low. In practice, I would say Kronbach's alpha should be at least 0.7. How do you calculate this? I don't tell you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a more complicated formula. And I, I didn't, everyone thinks that in practice you need to understand the formula. You do not even need to understand the formula of correlation. But, but when you do an analysis, yeah, you, you, should, you should be able to, to interpret it. And, and also when you, when you read uh, studies, 
what, what, what you were supposed to do as a student. And it comes to the term re reliability. We come, we come to this in the next episode. Uh, then very often they refer to Kronbach's alpha. And it's, it's, as I said, it's a term for, for internal consistency. Yeah? Do all the items in this test look into the same direction? Do they measure more or less the same thing? Do they all react in the same way on the same th theoretical concept? That's, that's the idea here. Okay, so um, in the next episode I would like to do a little bit an adventure into not only reliability but also validity and maybe objectivity, yeah, because they are very essential when it comes to testing. Okay, but that's for the moment about testing and thanks for watching, thanks for listening, see you next time.